We're almost live here. Um, hello, and welcome to the Balticon panel, The Motivations of Monsters. My name is Jean Marie Ward, and I'll be your moderator here today with four amazing panelists and writers, uh, Lee Murray, John Walker, Sherry Cook Wilsey, and John L. French. Welcome everyone. Um, before we get started on this, I'm going to ask everybody to uh, introduce themselves, uh, starting with Sherry. So hi, I'm Sherry Cook Woosley, and my novel is, I'm a writer, so my novel is Walking Through Fire. And I was lucky enough to have three different stories published in anthologies in 2021. So I have a fractured folklore dealing with Selkies on a distant planet in Once Upon a Dystopia. Um, I ride horses, so I have my uh, horse story in Thrilling Adventure Yarns 2021, uh, which came out from Crazy Ape Press. And I have At the Night Bazaar, which is a portal fantasy in Black Eyed Peas on New Year's Day. Cool. John? John Walker, I should say. This is going to get confusing. <laughs> just, just call me Walker. It, it gets, or, or just hey you, it works. Um, <laughs> I'm John Walker. I'm uh, author of the Stafford Chronicles, a fantasy noir series set in southeastern Virginia for the most part. Um, working, I have just put out my 13th book, uh, The Truth That Sticks, uh, and uh, it involves uh, a private detective of the gods who deals with, uh, oddly enough, crit, uh, mythical and legendary critters. Okay. It's like Including it's topical. Yeah, including some monsters. How about that? John, John L. French. <laughs> um, I'm John L. French, um, retired crime scene investigator with the Baltimore City Police Department, and now um, stay-at-home writer and editor. Uh, my latest book is When the Moon Shines, a story of, <clears throat> excuse me, two cryptids, the Snallygaster and the Dueo. Who get involved? Who are weaponized by some gang bosses during the Pro Prohibition era? I'm also the author of the Bianca Jones series, two books: um, Here There Be Monsters and Monsters Among Us, about a private detective who fights monsters and other things in Baltimore City. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool, Lee. Oh, quite pleased we're virtual then, if there's that many monsters floating around Baltimore City. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is um, Lee Murray, and as you can tell from this squeaky little accent, I'm not from where you are. Um, I'm from um, Aotearoa, New Zealand, and almost all of my fiction uh, involves monsters, including my two um, Bram Stoker winning titles, uh, Black Cranes, Tales of Unquiet Women, and Grotesque Monster Stories. Um, and I also have a couple of series, uh, the Tane McKenna Adventures, so they mostly involve New Zealand monsters. So um, monsters is my passion, so I'm very excited to be here with you all. Oh, cool. That's great. Well, you know, monsters are as monsters do, as the saying goes, or maybe it doesn't. But the point is that throughout all, every story that has ever existed, every storytelling culture has created stories of monsters, whether it be something as familiar to us as Polyphemus, the Cyclops in the Odyssey, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, or some of the more unusual monsters that show up in campfire tales uh, that have lately been made into movies from Point South, like I'm thinking of the Bunny Up, which is not New Zealand, but I'm sure that there are. Um, all cultures write stories, create stories about the monstrous, about the thing that's not us. Now, in some cases, those monsters are mindless destroyers, but in other cases, they are sympathetic or they are made sympathetic in retellings as you've, you know, as recent retellings of the tale of Beowulf, uh, his mother, Maleficent, and now lately Cruella de Vil. I don't know how you can make a puppy killer. Maybe the panelists can tell me that. What are some of the monsters who have connected with you or you feel have connected with a larger audience? I'm gonna start with you, Lee, because you were talking about those books, the uh, oh. your Bram Stoker winning title. So. <laughs> 
Oh, Let's I talk think it, about monsters who've connected. Well, I think an easy one is King Kong, for example. You know, um, it's just minding his own business and it's the people that are, you know, I think that's there's often that, you know, that sentient monster, well, not sentient, that monster that's just minding its own business, living its life and humans come in, come in on the scene and it just, you, you know, and it's displaced or, or what, for whatever reason. And I think that there, that is one of the key ways that we create sympathy for 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 our monster, um, where it's not monstrous metaphor. So I, I do think that 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 the, the, one of the first places to create sympathy is when the monster is simply living its life. It's doing its thing um, and it has no has no ne doesn't necessarily have any uh, animosity towards humans. And then the humans intervene and and that's what creates creates the conflict. So I think that's probably the first place to create sympathy. Okay. What about you, uh, John French? <laughs> hey, um, I've been doing a lot of reading and about uh, the cryptids um, for um, para Systema, Systema Paradoxa. Um, I mentioned Snallygasters and Dueo. Um, again, two creatures that humans would regard as monsters who are living their lives um, and get involved in human activities. I've also read and reread uh, Frankenstein for a project I'm working for with uh, for Padwolf Publishing, and um, I, I don't identify with uh, with the creature. I don't want to call him a monster, but um, Mary Shelley did not go out of her way to generate sympathy for the creature in that her, her point of view character, Victor Frankenstein, was blaming everything on his creation. But over time, I, especially the portrayal in the movies, has shown him to be somebody who was brought into this life, you know, and then abandoned by his parents. Both, um, you know, and actually, Shelley actually does draw a parallel between um, uh, the, the creature and uh, Satan, in that he he too was cast out of his of his home. So there is a sympathy in there. It's just that Shelley didn't go out of her way to make it make make it so. It might be more powerful because she didn't. Yes. Um, Otherwise, it would be, oh, we would be playing the world's tiniest violin for something that's roughly seven feet tall and supposedly with the proportions of a god. Uh, young Frankenstein sticks in my mind on that one. Okay, Sherry, what, what monster resonated with you? What monster do you think resonated with with the world. Well, I've always felt bad for Kelpies, you know, the, the water horses, right? And humans are told, oh, be careful. If you if you look at the horse, they're gonna they're gonna take you back into the ocean and you'll drown. And I just imagine these Kelpies are just like managing, you know, they're they're doing their own thing, they're over here, they're eating some grass. <laughs> I just think it's because humans are like, oh, you know, we're so worried about ourselves that you know when we come into their 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 land, their territory, then we get hurt. Mm -hmm. I think they've gotten framed a little bit. Um, I think of selkies who um, are sometimes considered monsters, you know, the women who are able to peel off their skin. And I'm like, no, that's not a monster. The reason they're considered monstrous is because when a human man wants to steal their skin and make them get married and they don't want to and want to get their skin back and get back to their home in the ocean, then suddenly it's like, oh yeah, they're monsters. They broke my heart. So that's, that's where, you know, I have to kind of question this whole idea of monster. Um, well, where the monster the, is, it does depend on where you're standing as the storyteller, doesn't absolutely, it? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I then think, there's you know, a, werewolves have changed, right? Yeah. The werewolf used to be terrifying. It's in different cultures. And yet in, um, in current urban fantasy, if you're a shapeshifter, then you tend to be one of the, you know, Good side. One of, the, one of the pro tags, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Walker, what about you? What is what is a uh, monster that resonated with you? What are monsters that you feel resonate with the world at large? I don't really have any that resonate with me. I write about uh, my protagonist is just a, nor a 
an every guy. He's not a he's you know he's not a shapeshifter or vampire or sparkly or otherwise um he's just a dude so i haven't really looked at that part but resonating i think consistently what resonates with the world is just the outsider the different because um because monstrous is a term that people use as far as like appearance and realize if the situation is reversed and everybody looks like, I don't know, a seven foot tall, somebody with proportion of the gods and somebody like me shows up. I'm the, mo- I, I look monstrous to them. So it's, it's, a, again, it's like, like was said, as was said, a, uh, you know, a matter of perspective, but I think just in general and outs, the outsider, the different um, is re- it really resonates, especially in the, uh, in the last you know year and a half, where everybody has been uh, sequestered and separated and s- forced into solitude. So I think that's really resonated a lot more with the world these days. So we're really all, in a sense, monsters coming out of our cave at the moment. Uh, one of the interesting, you know, synchronicity exists. One of the things that uh, came up in my life literally yesterday i was reading a story or a, an article about by a woman who felt herself to be monstrous because she had cross-eyed uh, cross eyes and small as that might seem and so very human as it is because there are there are history of 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 people throughout you know who've done great things i think of the poet Manat, uh Menander, who was famous for his strabismus, his cross eyes. It's a very human thing, but people looked at her as if she, or she felt people looked at her as if she was monstrous. And therefore she identified with the Cyclops from the Odyssey. Uh, And in fact, had found a poem uh, by a Greek poet, theoretically written by the Cyclops, who's trying to get a nymph to come live with him in his cave because he would always have fresh cheese to give her. And how human, how non-monstrous that is. Um, So it does seem to be a completely matter of perspective. Having said, you know, uh, monsters that resonate with people, um, have you seen any recently any revisitations of the monsters whether it be of beowulf's mother or maleficent that have um that you thought were done particularly well of expressing that otherness that sense that we are not monsters but we are merely different uh in in the world so john um uh, i really i really I know you have one that wasn't yes um, I really haven't seen recently seen any revisionist that, um, to me, it, you know, um, changed my mind about whether something is a monster or not. What I have seen a lot is explanations of movie movie treatments as to why these people, why these so-called monsters and uh, mostly human. Um, are the way they are going back to, um, you know, um, Hannibal Lecter and Hannibal Rising, which explains his um, unique appetite. Um, as you said, Maleficent, and then the uh, first Star Wars trilogy, which kind of puts a human face on, no pun intended, uh, Darth Vader. You know why he is the way he is. And I see, I see more and more of that, particularly with um, Cruella. I probably won't see the movie, but I have read a synopsis and a critique of it about, you know, why, how the person who became Cruella became what she is. So that's, you know, that's my take. And one of the things I've noticed here that we're sort of sliding into uh, humans as monsters humans being the most monstrous of all. Um, I don't know if we're gonna be going there with the panel. I'm not averse to it if the, if the rest of the panel wants to, 
but I just wanted to suddenly say, whoa, <laughs> that's interesting. We're all looking at the humans as the monsters. Um, okay. I am, leg um, I am legend. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, and um, gets back to perspective. Yeah. Uh, Sherry, were you about to say something? I was going to say that makes me think of Holly Black's uh, The Cruel Prince trilogy, in which it takes place in fairy, and then our point of view character is a human who has to become cruel enough, right, to take over the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't take much. <laughs> yeah, we have a, a tremendous capacity for cruelty. So, um, Lee, uh, do you want to uh, talk to you know, the, either the idea of a monster being made, a monster who is not sympathetic initially. I would say King Kong was always sympathetic if you saw the original movie. You couldn't escape the fact that this is a poor put upon monster. Um, and it's not even monstrous. He's the king of, the, he's the king of his world. Um, but do you, you know, do you want to talk to the humans as the monsters or would you rather talk to uh, you know, some uh, take on a quote monster or an other that has been done particularly well. I think it's really interesting because I think we all, I mean, we need to remember that the, the monsters are used in stories, I think, to help explain things and to, to help us make sense of the world, you know, and to explore our fears. So, you know, um, they're always a metaphor. They're always a metaphor for something, and and they're always a way of examining our own humanity um, in some ways, and that is why there is so much uh, reflection on the parallels between our monsters and our stories and human qualities. Um, and if, I mean, you know, they're always a way of looking at at human human reactions and responses and con and the consequences. So, uh, you know, if we if we think about just simple old zombie horror where the, the, the zombie is the monster and that is always looking at human reaction to an external force or um, Godzilla or a kaiju fiction which all about monsters and that is always looking at things like urbanization and globalization and those bigger things that we that we're struggling with that we want to understand and so I mean those you, you know those are created by us Godzilla is is that Come, comes out of the Cold War. It's a fear of, you know, that fear of globalization and the, the nuclear threat and our response to them. But those were created by us. Again, I think that goes back to John French's comment about um, Frankenstein, you know, that Frankenstein, if we're, we're thinking about, you know, who is the monster there? And it isn't, it isn't the monster. It's the human, isn't it? And the hubris and the let's create a monster and then just leave it to, to, to you know leave it to, on its own abandoned um, and 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 the trauma of that monster so that's how we create those the sympathy but we're really examining that human condition anytime I think we're looking at monsters we are we're always looking at human characteristics so yes I think you know some, there's there's two ways of looking at it the monster is the threat and that is looking at the way the way we respond to that threat and the monster is the thing we've created it's the hu the human monster um and and how and then it becomes sympathetic why are we that other and i think that that's particularly with um uh, black cranes tales of Un unquiet women is basically asian monsters and women looking at how those monsters reflect their their sense of otherness mm -hmm. um so uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a two-sided thing. I think we're always using monsters to examine humanity. Yeah, and I think in the original uh, George Romero trilogy, basically you start out thinking the zombies are the threat. And in the last movies, the zombies are basically just settling back to their suburban lives. They didn't, they weren't there. They weren't the ones shooting. They weren't the ones killing. They were just trying to get along with their lives. So it was a, a double pronged, you know, take on monstrousness, um, which gets back to where you stand being, and this is something that's coming up in the chat a lot, where you stand determines who the monster is. Is it the human? If you're a rabbit, it sure as hell is. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, Walker, uh, what about what about you? What, you know, what's your, 
do you want to talk about humans as monsters or do you want to talk about a uh, particularly good depiction of um, the otherness or the the enormity the, as the antagonist, whether it be Frankenstein, whether it be zombies, whether it be uh, Godzilla. She's giving me a choice. This is never a good sign. I'm so oh, options, <laughs> options. My husband let's go with says the, let's, I, I'm the let's queen go with the, of options. Well, let's go with the first one. What was the first one again? It sounded good. Okay. Do you want to talk about human monsters? Yes. Let's talk about human monsters because we're so dang good at it. And, uh, and, but also let's, but I'll, uh, yes, we are, humans do have a knack for self, for destruction, not just self-destruction, but destruction of, well, anything we put our minds to. And we look at that in some cases as a positive, you know, fighting the forces of evil, killing them and going off and, you know with the prom queen and that's great and all but also we have to understand that like let's let's you let's go to one of the most overrated movies i've ever seen avatar yes humans are the monsters yes it's 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 uh fern gully at writ large but it shows the monstrousness of humans as just hey we don't care we're we're, we're taking over america you know and we're doing all this and it shows that monstrousness that, hey, there's two, there's two natives. We don't care. Run them over. Okay. That, all that does is just show how the capacity for cruelty that, that humans have. And we keep pushing the envelope in that, in, that, in those monsters. Uh, the, the Saw saga, which, no. Okay, we, we don't even have to go with Hannibal. Hannibal had a had at least a a sort of plot. Saw was just I am a monster. I'm going to kill as many people as possible in the most cruel ways imaginable. Great. Okay, we don't need to see that. I mean, this I don't need to see this this cruelty, but you know, some people enjoy it. But as far as um, humans being monsters. Yes, we're very good at it. Not only are we very good at it, we ref- we have refined it into a multitude of stories over the years. And I, I mean, I, I've actually thrown books away just because I'm like, okay, don't need it. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. This actually gets into something Sherry was talking about, but drilling it down further, we aren't only uh, monstrous to the other, we are monstrous to ourselves. Uh, the whole Selkie myth uh, can, you, can be seen as a uh, discussion of gender roles. Do you want to talk about that, Sherry? Sure. So, um, like I said, I actually wrote a story about the Selkie myth set on a different planet in um, Once Upon a Dystopia because that idea has just really stuck with me. And it, like you said, it's because can there be a male Selkie? Yes, I think there can. But generally it's considered the female who's being taken as a wife. And some of the reasons are you were too beautiful. I couldn't help it. I had to steal your skin. Or I needed you for breeding purposes so that living on this island, my children would be able to um, belong to the sea in a better way. So it's, it's really like changing the narrative of the story to make it what the stronger force wants, right? And so that's how I am reading that mythology. So stories are, so it's not only history that's written by the victors or by the strong, it's the stories themselves because right. they're the survivors who've been able to tell the story. So yeah, okay, John, uh, John French, okay. You wanna talk about human monsters or do you wanna talk about a, um, a monster who has been written so that you identify with them? Um. Unfortunately, in my, my previous line of work, I have encountered quite a few human monsters. So let's talk about the other thing. 
one thing that did occur to me are the stories that show the monster within us. For instance, the poor, you know, one I feel, I feel, I feel sorry for is the classical werewolf who is just going, going about his own business, taking a simple walk through the woods. And all of a sudden, one bite later, you know, he's waking up naked in a field next to a dead cow or another dead human or something. He didn't want to be a monster, but now he is the thing that even he himself fears and will be hunted until he's dead. There is the um, Jekyll and Hyde in which in trying to explore the dual nature of humanity, um, Henry Jekyll suddenly turns himself into a monster so that, you know, he, you know, he did have a choice at the beginning, but at the end, he no longer has a choice. You know, it's the, uh, to me, a monster is something that is both out of what we, re uh, something other than what we regard as normal and terrifying to those who are normal. And um, there's just so many um, humans who, who fit that definition. And at the same time, there are the ones that, um, you know, are come from outside. A, as you mentioned, King Kong was not necessarily a monster on Skull Island. He was a god, but put him in the middle of Manhattan and suddenly he's a monster. Mm -hmm. uh, do we... You know, we've, we've explored some of these things. And uh, there's a very fascinating question that just popped up uh, talking about human monsters. Uh, there's a fascinating question here um, in, the, in the question and answers are, are monster stories used as justification for bullying? Uh, an individual is different. Ergo, we must subdue that individual before something bad happens. Um, how do you feel about that way of viewing monsters? Uh, beginning with you, uh, John French, and then we'll go around again. Um, I think um, people react negatively to things that are different enough that it scares them. Um, a child who's different in school um, might just suggest that, you know, how, you know, might just bring out the fact that where well, we're all different, if I can do something to this one, um, then I'm with the crowd and I'm no longer different, which basically this attitude basically creates monsters, you know, the, the, you know, to the, um, to the victim who, person bullying to the, to the so-called monster. The one everybody sees is different. Um, the bully becomes the monster, the thing that keeps you up at night. Lee? Yeah, I think that, that we're talking now about the sort of sentience, aren't we? And the, the monster getting its own back. So something like Jaws, you know, where he could have just gone off, you know, Jaws could have just you know, the shark could have just swum away and instead it comes back and it, it and it is, you know, persistent. And so um, I think I think it's interesting because when we I'm going to sort of see because I, I wanted to seek off John's earlier point, And that was, you know, um, the, the sympathy of of um, of monsters. And I think that there's a also that I that notion actually that sometimes our heroes are the monsters, um, our superheroes. If you think of Superman, I mean, if it if it if he hadn't wanted to be a force for good, you know, he's invincible. You know, that's terrifying. When somebody can, you know, any no, no one no one can defeat him. That is that is absolutely a terrifying for us. So we have to give them a flaw. So that is you know that that idea of you know werewolf doesn't have any control you know the moon comes up and and there's no control and then they're hunted or uh, the hulk for example who is is our hero um and he has no control about his own he can't control his own anger and his own uh that that 
that transformation. So we have to give our monsters a floor, even when they're our heroes, you know, um, because very often they are the hero of the story. So um, I've written one myself where, uh, where the, the creature the, the, is, is a, is a um, you know, a genetically modified human with rhinoceros hands, which allows him to seek water and, uh, in, a, in a dystopian world where there is very little water. So he does that. He looks for water through rock using these, these rhinoceros hands made out of hair. Um, and he, because he's got these hands, he can, he, he's all powerful, but he can't, he can't feed himself and he can't dress himself. So he's completely vulnerable. And so although he's the hero and also the monster of the story, he is, we need to give them that human vulnerability so I'm sorry, I, I'm changing the subject, but I just, I really thought John's point was excellent about, you know, that vulnerability of our monsters and how, you know, when we're terrified, we need to, we need to give them that, 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 um, you know, that something, that weakness that allows us as humans to, because we, we have this hubris that we want to overcome the monster. So I think in that bullying instance, you know, we need some way of, you know, some way of still conquering the monster because that is, you know, it's one of those seven, one of those seven key stories, conquer the monster, isn't it? So as humans, we feel like we need to control that. Um, and uh, yes, Sorry, I completely got off the topic, but John's point was so interesting. There are no wrong answers, really. (laughs) Getting off the topic is sort of what we're here for, is to have a free-ranging discussion, which is admittedly a little bit harder in Zoom, where we don't don't get quite the same interplay we do in real life. So, but no, it was it was a lot of great points there, a lot to unpack that I might unpack in a few some further questions. Okay, if if I may, a minute to. Yeah. Uh, follow up with what Lee said. Um, I think a great example of this, whatever you think of the movies, um, were in um, was the follow up. You know, was in Batman versus Superman, in which half the people in the well, half the general population in the movie saw Superman as some kind of savior god while the other ones considered the implications of, you know, look what happened in Metropolis. This is an unstoppable creature who could kill us all if he, if he got, you know, if he got out of the, which, and so another, another self-made monster, Batman, who dresses like a monster to scare the hell out of the bad guys, um, decides he's going to be the monster hunter. You know, Lex Luthor aside, Batman took them, got the materials he needed to kill Superman and then set out to to do exactly that. And it was only in the face of a completely different monster, plus coincidence coincidence of two women named Martha, that, uh, you know, basically brought, you know, brought the two, you know, perceived monsters in, in reality heroes together. So um, being a monster is mostly a matter of perception. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, that's an interesting point. I hadn't thought about that, that movie. But to get back to the, the question that uh, Charles Chaplin asked, um, Walker, uh, do you think that monster stories are basically a justification for bullying? In some cases, yes, absolutely. Because uh, what you're, because what ha- what usually happens with the monster, you get the whole village together, you hand out the torches and the pitchforks, and some somebody is always the get get the get the monster, and it's just it, maybe it's some some guy who's some poor guy who's got I don't know who's missing half his hair right here, or he's got or there or it's a it's a woman with you know a you know a lump on her head that you know it's a tumor or something you know something like that it's again we're talking about the outsider yes thank you as we kill the beast you know that's exactly what it is and it justifies it because what it does is shows that it's it's culling the weak the different the outsider out of the pack it's a very 
pack mentality. And um, as someone who has been bullied and who was bullied in, you know, in school, in high, in grade school, high school, um, and dealt uh, and dealt with that, uh, it's something that uh, it's, it's, it's hard to come back from that and to see, to fight against the, the crowd, the mob and say, look, I'm not, you know, I am a man, not an animal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, just to pull that, that nice little, thank you. But look at this. I mean, look, we got the uh, Shrek hunchback from Notre Dame, Carrie. Yeah. Are they monsters? Yes. But who made them the monster? So it, you know, I, my vote was, hey, Carrie wants to dance. She wants to be the homecoming queen. Rock on. She looked great. You know, so it, it turns into who just because they are a monster doesn't mean they were a monster, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Okay. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Sherry, what about you? Do you, do you, yes. Follow- Okay. So I agree with a lot of what Walker just said. Thank you for um, for speaking that. And I think then if we agree, then the next step then is to maybe examine our monsters. And there's one traditional monster we haven't talked about yet, which is vampires. Mm-hmm. Interesting kind of look at maybe the origin of vampires, which was literally a body coming back, disgusting. You had to use the garlic, the rosary, right? The crucifix and how that idea has changed, right? Because maybe that was a literal manifestation of of a monster of death, of of the undead turning into, then you've got Bram Stoker's Dracula, where now you're talking about a foreigner coming to London. You've got the sexuality of of the the succubi. You've got different fears being projected onto the same monster coming all the way up to our favorite sparkly vampires, where uh, saga, you've got some vampires who have a certain color eye because they eat a certain type of meat slash blood. And you've got others who are choosing to live a different way and have a different eye color. And, and look, this is not spoiling, okay? We've all read the books, we know what happened. So it doesn't spoil it to say that Bella, whose eyes we're seeing through, chooses to become a monster. So that's very different from the, the idea of vampires historically and the way it's changed throughout the societies and cultures that have told that story. Yep, definitely. Um, but if there's another aspect to this that we haven't really gotten at, and I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Um, basically, when we're crafting stories as writers, we set up a strong protagonist, but as we all know, our story is only as good as our antagonist, as the villain, as the, the entity that we are fighting against. How do we balance humanism you know, just being, and I use humanism because there is no word that expresses it without human in it. Uh, this feeling of even handedness, of understanding and empathy. How do we balance that with crafting an exciting story if we do not create an antagonist who is out there and bigger than us and stronger than us? whether or not they have the fairy tale flaw that allows us the kryptonite that allows us to defeat this and this great antagonist so how do we craft exciting stories without falling back on the monster trope so sherry you start off on this one so that's a really good question And I think as authors, we do need to be aware of what are we valuing in our protagonist and what are we representing in our antagonist. And that's where as writers, we have to also be a little bit of sociologist and a little bit of psychologist to see what it is that we're getting at and how we want to frame this and also illuminate it. Um, 
So in the novel I'm working on right now, which is a follow-up to Walking Through Fire, I have Sumerian gods literally walking through the Appalachian Mountains, walking through Baltimore. And so they have immense power, but they also have very human characteristics, which give them the flaws, right? Um, and so I have that, that power that, that our, our protagonist has to go up against. And I have the, the gods certainly not being perfect and, and being so imperfect that, for example, I'm using the god An, who is the weather god. And so he is setting up his territory in a certain way that values what he is the god of. I have Anlil, who um, is a god of wind. And in his territory, he's using, um, he creates a dystopia because he believes in capitalism to the point of it being too much. Right, and so we have indentured servants that he's creating. And so for me, that's how I'm setting up my antagonists where they're taking things to the extreme. And that's what has to be dismantled by my, by my protagonists. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Walker, uh, what, you know, how do you balance one's humanism, one's humanity in the, in the positive sense with the need for an oversized antagonist to create a create a uh, an exciting story, how do you avoid falling into the monster trope? Very carefully. That's. I mean, you're going you're going to go. I mean, the stuff I write is pulp novels. I write. I I freely admit I write pulp noir fantasy novels. It's the guy is always out outclassed he's always getting his his face beat in but it but for the balance of it most of the most of the monsters that are in my book in my books are the are of the human kind but they've accepted help from elsewhere um so they they um and somebody brought up uh in the chat about uh, monsters uh, about how werewolves and vampires some of them make the choices to become the monster um and uh it can play and i was i'm like yeah that plays upon as the earlier question the bullying idea it's a way for the bully to fight back against the mob and it really to me says you know that's how you that's how you balance it you have to make the monsters relatable you definitely have to make them relatable, but you have to, you kind of have to push the idea that yes, it's like, like I said, when we were talking earlier, like with, you know, with Chris, what Chris Rock said, I don't condone it, but I understand it. So we have to, we have to say, yeah, we, we understand if we were in that situation, we might go that route, but we, we can't because our morality, our reasons, our what have you. So, like I like I said, it boils down to two words: very carefully. <laughs> Lee, what about you? How do you balance the need to tell a great, you know, your humanism with the need to tell a story with an outsized antagonist? Yeah, I think that is a little bit coming down to crafting and. You know, I think a lot of it, particularly when you're creating fear and uh, is the uncertainty. So your protagonist doesn't always know, you know, they may well be discovering the monster as they go. So they have no idea how that monster will behave. And, and that I think is where you create a lot of the interest, the conflict, because your, your protagonist does not know. And it, I think that is really partly why we use monsters, isn't it? To explore the things we don't know and we don't understand. And we, so we send some hero into the fray to try and find out for us and we put it on the page so we can understand it in real, in, in real life. How might we behave, the, the ordinary man or the ordinary person in this situation when faced with this monster? We don't know. So, I mean, if we just take COVID, you know, we didn't know, we had no idea. So we're our heroes, what are they doing? How are we behaving? You know, how does humanity respond to this threat? And I think the uncertainty and the pacing of our story 
um, you know, when things are revealed is very important to, to, to if we're talking about crafting a story um, and creating that suspense and, um, and discovering what the flaw might be in order to overcome that monster or Sometimes we don't overcome the monster. Sometimes we just set it aside. We put it, we sometimes corral it in ways that, okay, we're going to put it off. We manage it later. We've survived this moment, this incident. And then the monster continues and we, it's going to come back. You know, it's only just, it's only just put, being put to the side because we still need to deal with it, like climate change and um, um, feminism, you know, witches, you know, how, how many times are the witches the monsters, you know, and... And that is just dealing with women and 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 women's you know um, agency. So these things are addressed over and over again. And so a lot of it is you know um, just putting putting our our hero in the in, in a situation where they don't they don't know exactly how our monster will behave in this particular case. Okay, John uh, John French. Uh... What about you? Uh, how do you balance your humanity with the need for an outside antagonist? Um, a lot of my stories deal with humans, well, there's one exception, but with humans who are faced with a very formidable foe. I try to make the foe interesting. I try to make it so that the foe is unless the humans behave very carefully, we'll, we'll beat them. And so it's essentially how, to, how does this group of humans who have taken on the job of Monster Hunter, be it um, Bianca Jones, who's actually fighting monsters, or private detectives who are fighting human monsters, how do they defeat them? And then it's basically, a, to me, a puzzle story. You know, here is your problem, here is our problem, here is our solution. And then um, I try to throw in, I found that um, in a lot of my stories, I try to throw in um, the possibility of some redemption for what we are calling a monster. You know, the bad guy, you know, uh, Bianca is, ba Bianca and some other characters are basically seeking not only to defeat the monster, but bring them around to a, be a, a better a better point of view let's, let's put it that way okay uh that's a good way to you know this question was a good one to go out on because we're really brushing up the end of our time so i'm going to ask all of our panelists uh you guys were great uh to give folks a briefly what you got coming out and where can they find you on the web as quickly as possible john you first okay i just posted a link to my Amazon authors page so that should any of you be interested in any of my books, you'll be able to find it. Um, my next thing is um, at seven o'clock, what might be the most controversial panel on the Balticon, the Snyder cut of Justice League versus the theatrical cut. <laughs> better, and, the, better you than me, man. Better yeah, you and, me. As, <laughs> and as punishment for my sins, I am the moderator. Oh, that is punishment for your sins. Yes, you please. I mean, if, if I die at eight o'clock, I go straight at, straight to heaven. Yes, you do. Okay, Lee, uh, what what new books have you got coming out, and where can folks find you on the web? Um, new books coming out on monsters. Um, I'm working on, on anything. Your any of yeah. your titles. I'm okay. working on Unquiet Spirits at the moment, which is a book of essays on um, Asian monsters and um, and where uh, and also responses by um, um, Asian writers to those particular monsters. So that's I'm working on that with um, Angela Eureka Smith, the publisher of Space and Time. I'm also working on a poetry collection called Fox Spirit on a Distant Cloud, which looks at the Asian diaspora in New Zealand through the eyes of a monster, of, of a fox spirit monster and the different iterations of its life. Um, this week I have Mark My Words come out, which is a uh, is just a book on how to self-edit your work. So <laughs> because I do a lot of work with mentees and so I um, thought I'd better do something and it and a handout turned into a book so that's this week's book um but um people can find me um on social media or check out my website leemurray.info cool walker what about you 
Uh, I just released uh, The Truth That Sticks. It's the 13th novel in a, in the Stafford Chronicles. As I said, a fantasy noir about a private detective of the gods. Um, also trying to decide how I'm going to put out a serial, I'm sorry, a post-apocalyptic Western, either as a serial or just as one big thing. So uh, you can find me on Amazon, amazon.com slash author slash John G. Walker. You can Google the Stafford Chronicles and there I am. Okay, cool. And Sherry? Um, so my website is www.tasteofsherry.com. I'm on Twitter at Sherry Woosley, Instagram, Facebook. And um, my debut novel is out, Walking Through Fire. And I've got the second and third books coming out shortly. Cool. Very cool. And I'm Jean Marie Ward at jeanmarieward.com. And I want to thank ev- all of the panelists for being great here on the panel today. Thank you out there in the audience for Balticon. We Loved reading your chat and your questions. We tried to get to them where we could or to weave them into the thing. And finally, a big shout out to our tech goddess, Liana. Thank you for uh, keeping us on track. And that's it for uh, the Motivations of Monsters on Balticon 2021. Thank you. <laughs>